morning, happy Sunday, family. I bring you greetings from Drayton Mills Church of Christ. I hope and pray all is well with you. I hope you've had a blessed week. I hope you've had a productive week. And if you don't mind, meet me in Psalm 127. We're going to close out our series entitled The Pilgrimage. We started this series back in September, and today we are going to close it out. So meet me in Psalm number 127. And there... The psalmist writes in verse one, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. That's enough title of this sermon. It's like those of the previous weeks entitled The Pilgrimage, Part 6. The Pilgrimage, Part 6. Beloved, this series was entitled The Pilgrimage because of the double entendre that it represents. So on the one hand, these are songs uh, that were meant to encourage the pilgrims on their journey to the National Feast in Jerusalem. But on the other hand... They're also meant to encourage us on our own pilgrimage to the New Jerusalem. Each of the 15 songs present some of the most poignant and powerful life lessons one needs to master as they pilgrimage through life. If you remember, in week one, we meditated on Psalm 121, in which the life lesson was simply, at some point in time in your pilgrimage, you will fear the unknown. You will be anxious about the unexpected. You'll be troubled and, and overwrought with worry about what if or what might. And on that day, the psalmist would have you to know simply that God is a keeper. If you remember in week two, we meditated on Psalm 123, in which the life lesson was simply that at some point in time in your pilgrimage, you will deal with enough ignorant folk, you will be faced with enough evil talk and find yourself in one of the most dangerous situations a child of God can find themselves. And that's when you've reached your breaking point. But the psalmist would have you to know that when you reach your breaking point, that is when you need to keep your eyes on the Lord. In week three, we meditated on Psalm 124. And if you remember, uh, the life lesson was simply that at some point in time in your pilgrimage, you'll find out the rough reality that life is too hard and too complex, too dangerous, too volatile uh, for you to handle. But the psalmist will want you to know that if you keep walking with God, no matter how treacherous life may be, you will undoubtedly have the testimony that if it had not been for the Lord, who was on our side. Week four, we jumped into Psalm 126 in which the life lesson was simply that life does not exempt you from impossible situations, nor does life uh, shelter you from insurmountable mountains. But the psalmist would have you know that when that day comes, you have got to learn to trust in the promises of God because where there are tears sown, you will reap shouts of joy. And last week, if you joined us, we were in Psalm 131, in which the life lesson was simply that if you want to follow God's lead in your life, and if you want to follow God's direction through your life, then you must consistently and constantly calm and quiet and discipline your soul so that you can differentiate between what is of God and what is of self. And so, my brothers and sisters, it brings us to Psalm 127, in which I want to close out this series because this is a life lesson. That is so difficult for us to grasp. It's a life, it's a, it is a life lesson that is so ingrained in our contemporary society. It's a life lesson that is ingrained in our philosophical and academic ideals. It's in our psyche. It's in our hearts. It's, it's what we push on ourselves and push on our children the moment they enter into the world. And that is simply that one must be successful. We push on ourselves that you must achieve that you must be prosperous. And I, I know uh, we've all been told and we tell ourselves that I need to make it. I need to arrive. I need to do well and sit well and be well to do and be well off. And that is a hard life lesson for some of us to receive in our spirit because we fundamentally believe that I am thriving and I am succeeding if somehow I have power or prestige or position or pleasures or prosperity. We fundamentally believe that my life will be good as long as it, as it is uh comprised and composed of some formula or ratio of money to possession to acclaim to uh, applause and we believe that that success formula so much that we will sacrifice years and money and family and relationships and sleep all in the pursuit to succeed but the psalmist would have you to know that before you waste your life trying to make your life special and before you spend all of your energy trying uh, to make something of yourself and before you dedicate all of your strength and vitality towards making it, you need to know that unless the Lord builds it 
And unless the Lord watches over it, no matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, no matter what you achieve, no matter what you build, it will be in vain. Beloved, one of the most important things to highlight about Psalm 127 is the author. And in order for us to really appreciate the life lesson that is presented here, we need to know a little bit about the history of the author. This psalm is accredited to King Solomon. If you remember, Solomon is the son of King David and Bathsheba. But more importantly, Solomon's life is one that is highlighted as being successful. If you remember, it's Solomon's reign as opposed to David's reign in which Israel saw the height of his influence and the height of its power. It was during Solomon's reign that they built the massive army. It was during Solomon's reign in which the treasury was overflowing. It was during Solomon's reign in which they built great ships. It was during Solomon's reign in which the kingdoms were paying tributes to them. Solomon was the definition of a ladies man. Solomon had 700 wives. Solomon had 300 concubines. And if you remember in 1 Kings chapter 3, God God appears uh, to Solomon in a dream and ask him for something. Solomon replies that I want wisdom. And so you find out that God blesses Solomon with a wisdom that is unmatched in the ancient world. Matter of fact, if you just flip over one chapter, it says that he spoke 3000 proverbs and more than a thousand songs. And the Bible says that people would come near and far just to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And so, beloved, Solomon's crowning achievement also is that he built two of the most important houses in Israel-like history. For 13 years, he built the palace of the king. And for seven years, he built the temple of the Lord. So when you run Solomon's history, what you find out is that Solomon had all the money one could have. Solomon had all the power one could have. Solomon had all the love and affection from people that one could want. Uh, Solomon had all the wisdom and knowledge that one could ever want. Solomon built a legacy that would outlive him. So you can say by every metric, every standard, every test that Solomon was successful. Solomon was a made man. Solomon had reached the pinnacle. Solomon had achieved. But despite having gained the whole world, Solomon still says that unless the Lord builds it and unless the Lord watches over it, then whatever you do is in vain. And when you watch the flow of the text in verses one and two, you see the same, this redundant phrase in vain, in vain, in vain. Beloved, he says you build in vain. He says you watch over it in vain. He says you get up and lie down in vain. When Solomon says that it's in vain, he uses this unique Hebrew word shav. Shav simply means emptiness. It's used to speak about something that has no effect. It's used to speak to something that denotes nothingness, but don't miss it. He says the in vain is interconnected and predicated on another and preceding verse uh, phrase, which says, unless the Lord, which means that if God is not in it and if God has not approved it and if God is not imbued and immersed in it, then whatever success you think you're going to achieve will be empty. And beloved, that's a sobering life lesson for, for that Solomon presses on us this morning that he wants to show us how to and how not to pursue success. Beloved, uh, it, verse one, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Success is this is my first point. Success is dependent solely upon God. That's my first point. It's not deep. It's not highly theological, but it's simple and practical that success is dependent solely upon God. Beloved, when, when you read Hebrew poetry, I want you to make a note of this. You should always look for what is called parallelisms. And, and, and parallelisms not only outline the structure of the psalm, but it also helps to speak to his theology. And what you see in verse one is you see parallel action of building and watching, creating and conserving. Beloved, building a house is metaphoric for building things in life and, and watching over a city is metaphoric for protection over something that is in our possession. So God is building in verse one. We're building in verse one. God is watching over in verse one and verse one. We're watching over in verse one. So Solomon is using the concept of creating and conserving as being a picture of the sum total of life. That's how life works. That's how life operates. We, we work to bring things into fruition or we try to protect those things that are already in fruition 
That's how we operate in our life. We 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 building a resume. We're building a business. We're building a portfolio. We're building assets. We're building a family. We're building relationships. We're building a reputation, and and we're trying to constantly create. Or we're trying to conserve that which we've already created. So we operate through life by trying to protect the business that we build and protect our investment and protect our family and protect our name and protect our retirement and protect our marriage because we succeed success as a series of creating and conserving, creating and conserving. But what this parallelism in verse one says to us is that the reality of success falls into only one of two possibilities, either the Lord will be doing it or it will be pointless and so beloved there, there's no other option there he simply says that either god will be in it or it will not be successful and i need you to come here i need you to realize the implication of what he's saying in verse one he is simply saying that if success is predicated solely on god then that means that success cannot be measured quantitatively success cannot be measured by dollar amounts or viewerships or recognition or popularity or fame or numbers if success is dependent solely on god that means that success cannot be measured by contracts or square footage or horsepower or titles or deals or commissions success cannot be measured by applause or admiration or infatuation or acceptance hear me beloved because success cannot be measured by retweets or likes or followers or crowds beloved a successful life is a life that is being built by god is a life that's being managed by god and it is a life that is being approved by god a successful life is a life that is being preserved by god and it is a life that's being protected by god and beloved i really want you to hear me that there's nothing wrong with power or position or prestige or, or prosperity or pleasure those are not bad things those are not sinful things but they are just that they are just things but if you want a successful life a good life then you really need to get this that that cannot be found outside of god almighty because god is life Moses made it very clear in Genesis when he declared Barashit bara Elohim, which simply means that in the beginning, God, which means that God himself is the source of all life. God himself is the derivation of all life. God himself is the antecedent of all life. God himself is the sole determinant of all life. And it is not you, my brothers and sisters. God determines how life goes and how life plays out. God expunged all life in the generation of Noah. God erased life in Sodom and Gomorrah. God erased life in a generation out there in the wilderness. But conversely, God brought life to Sarah when her womb was barren. God brought life to Hannah when her womb was barren. God brought life to Rebecca when her womb was barren. God brought life to Elizabeth when her womb was barren. What are you saying, brothers? I'm saying that there is no such thing as life outside of God. There's no such thing as blessings outside of God or security outside of God or peace outside of God or joy outside of God. There is no prosperity that comes from the work that you can do, but prosperity and success or anything good or marvelous comes into existence by the author of life. And so, beloved, if you want to find that success, then you should find out what the author of life has in store for you. So the first point is simple. It's just that success is dependent solely upon God. But the second point, when you read verse two, it says, it is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Beloved, that's simple. In verse one, Solomon's pressing on us that success is dependent solely upon God. And if you can get that, then you can get the second point simply. And the second point is just this, that success is not your responsibility. In verse two, Solomon, what he does is he's giving us the depiction of, again, it's almost like a recapitulation about how we tend to approach life. We tend to get up, work our fingers to the bone uh, to succeed, and then we go to bed. But notice from the outset, he says, before you even get up, before you lay down, before you go back and forth to your life, 
it is already in vain. Because if you don't get the point one, that success is solely dependent upon God, then you will somehow think that it is your responsibility to be something or make something or achieve something or preserve and protect something when the reality is that you will kill yourself working to achieve something that will ultimately be empty. When he says that you're eating the bread of anxious toil, anxious toil in, in, in Hebrew is simply one word that means etseb. Etseb means to strangle something. It's a very powerful word. And, and it's often used to describe a mind that is being strangled or in distress. So essentially, eating the bread of anxious toil is a euphemism for stress. Beloved, notice Solomon never says that you're not going to build the house. He never says that you're not going to watch over the city. And the fact that he says that there is bread, actual bread, means that something has been accomplished, that something has been achieved, but at what cost? The cost of living a life of anxious toil. And beloved, that's exactly what happens when you don't realize that success is not your responsibility. You kill yourself mentally and physically when you don't realize that success is not your responsibility. You'll live enslaved in this mentality, this grind of early mornings and late nights, all in an attempt to be successful. When you don't realize that success is not your responsibility, you'll walk around with the weight of the world on your shoulders. When you don't realize that success is not your responsibility, you'll have all these sleepless nights wondering and worrying about whether you're going to graduate, whether you're going to pass, whether you're going to get hired. You worry, have these sleepless nights worrying about whether you're going to get the deal done, whether you're going to get the house, whether you're going to keep the doors open and you kill yourself worrying about success. When Solomon says, God does not want you living like that, but God gives to his beloved sleep. Beloved, when you're able to sleep peacefully, and when you're able to operate as if you've got rest, that is evidence that you are not stressed. When you're able to sleep peacefully and you're able to operate day to day as if you got rest, that's evidence that you feel protected. That's evidence that you feel secure. And beloved, that is a very good verse to go to sleep on, that he gives his beloved sleep. In other words, what Solomon is saying is that when you go to bed tonight, you need to lay down and go to sleep. You don't need to roll around. You don't need to toss and turn. No need to crunch the numbers in your head. No need to run through your talking points. No need to worry about the meeting. No need to ponder about what if. No, you need to lay your butt down and go to sleep because when you understand that success is dependent upon God. And when you understand that success is not my responsibility, then you understand things are going to work out how they're going to work out. And things are going to be exactly how they're going to be. And things are going to play out exactly how they're going to play out. And I'm going to end up exactly where God wants me to end up. Beloved, you ought to lay down and go to sleep because when you realize that I am God's beloved, my brothers and sisters, you already know that I am successful. You already know that I am, that I've made it. Because when you realize that I am the beloved of God, I already got the title I want. When you realize I'm the beloved of God, I already got the approval that I want. When you realize that I'm the beloved of God, I already got the relationship that I want. Tell me what's better than being loved by God. What relationship is better than being loved by God? What title can I get that's better than being loved by God? My brothers and sisters, you got to understand that when you're beloved by God, you're already successful. And so, as I close, I want you to contemplate how does the Bible describe success? That's a good question. That's a good study. How does the Bible speak about a person that is successful? And, and they use this universal term, blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed. You see it in Psalm 1. You see it in, in Matthew 5. Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be, blessed be. But the thing about it is that the people who are blessed has nothing to do with 
money. It has nothing to do with power. It has nothing to do with prestige. It has nothing to do with position. It simply has everything to do with a relationship with God. And so, beloved, I, I hope that this series has helped you, but I, I hope that you take away from this sermon that success is not my responsibility, but success is solely dependent upon God Almighty. And so, my brothers and sisters, I pray that you rekindle that relationship with God. I pray that you put your strength and your vitality towards building things with God. I pray that whatever endeavor you have in life, you infuse and saturate God in that. My brothers and sisters, I pray that this series has helped you. At this moment, let's go before God and, and uh, his throne and uh, let us bow. The heavenly most gracious Father, we want to thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you for this opportunity to just sit before you, hear another portion of your word, to worship you, to give you back just a small portion of what you continue to give to us. Father, continue to keep your hand on uh, this country. Continue to keep your hand on this pandemic. The numbers are rising. Father, we just pray that you keep your hand of protection around all of us, Father. Uh, dear Lord, we just also pray that as we travel through life, that we not chase after fool's gold, Father, but just remember that success is dependent upon you, Father, and remember that it is not our responsibility to be successful. It is our responsibility to walk with you, Father. And so we just pray that as we close out this series, Father, that these life lessons are able to take hold in our spirits, then, Father, you're able to bring forth a harvest that will produce, Father, further righteousness. And all these things we ask in the name of your most precious and holy Son, Jesus Christ, let everybody say, Amen. May God bless you. May God keep you. And prayerfully, we'll see you next week.
Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, it reads as follows, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night, and when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had sup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Dear Almighty Heavenly Father, again you've granted us this opportunity to pray unto thee, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this bread which represents your son's body which was crucified upon the cross, as well as this fruit of the vine, dear Heavenly Father, which represents his blood that was shed upon that same cross. Heavenly Father, we do it in remembrance of him until he comes. It's in your son, uh, Jesus' name, that we ask it all. Let us all say amen. amen. Let us partake together. Good morning, Sigsby. Let us prepare to give back to God. Now about the collection of the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Join me in prayer. Heavenly and gracious Father, we come to you just now, dear Lord. Thank you for this day you've blessed us with, Father God. Thank you for the ability to continue to, 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 to earn and make gain, dear Lord. Father, as we give what we have purpose in our heart, dear Lord, we just pray. We pray for the leaders of the money, Father God, allow them to make the decisions that are in best interest of not only Sigsby, but you, Father God, praying that they do with the money that you have 
taught and instructed them to do, Father God. And just thank you. Thank you for our jobs, dear Lord. Thank you for keeping us healthy, Father God. All these things we ask through your loving Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it's time for our closing prayer. Uh, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we want to first come to you in prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you so much for all that you've done for this congregation and our members. Thank you for the growth that we can see on the horizon of your blessings, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, at this time, we also want to pray for any loss or any sicknesses that have really just touched our congregation and members. We pray that you keep them safe and keep your heart pure and their minds stead on Jesus. Heavenly Father, we also want to continue to pray about the COVID-19 disease. We pray that everyone can stay safe and pray for some relief with this, this epidemic. Heavenly Father, we know that you are in control. And we just lean on you for any guidance or any, any rest, dear Lord. Finally, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for just, just your son, down on the cross, Heavenly Father. And we just always want to appreciate the things that you've blessed us with. And it's his name we pray.